Hey everyone, uh, my name is Bobby Duran and we're back with our uh, another segment here with uh, Dr. Dan Hodge. And as you look around this, this beautiful artwork behind us, uh, we are located at the Bluebird Art House in Whittier, California. And uh, th this is such a great place to come and, and, and uh, check out some of the artwork and they're known for uh, having events here and things like that. So just look that up, bluebirdarthouse.com uh, for some uh, information on that. As we're here with Dan, Dan, I, I know we've talked about a few different things here. We've talked about the theology of hip hop. We talked about community. We talked about a theology of suffering, the four elements, and we've covered so many different areas that I think uh, people might have questions on and, and aren't sure about or just not really sure if, if hip hop could be something that they would even consider uh, giving a chance to. And so with all those things in mind, can you help us understand, like, what's the best way, what are some known practices, what's the 101 mm -hmm. uh, for even just how to engage uh, a hip-hop community, a hip-hop culture? Uh, what are some ways that, that people can do that? I know we've talked about meet people where they're at to even have a conversation, but what are some ways to engage the hip-hop culture? Absolutely. I think, uh, and that's really a really good question as we're thinking about, you know, how do you really begin to think about a mission or a missiology towards this community, uh, partly because it's, it's, it's really a largely unreached people group when you think about just from a missions perspective. Um, entering into a culture or society is always a, uh, a big step for most people. And, I'm, and right now, I, what I'd like to do is kind of address somebody who just doesn't know anything about it and just coming at it kind of from like, what do I do? You know, I wear Birkenstocks and Uggs, and then I don't know how, you know, much of that is, you know, hip hop. You know, well, I would say, with if that's who you are, um, is to really, you know, there's plenty of folks around that you can ask questions. You know, show up to a venue. Start with a spoken word event where you can just kind of come in and gradually ease, ease your way. There's plenty of events that, that show that last, you know, um, a few weeks ago we had a book signing uh, and I had like five spoken word artists and I had several friends who, you know, kind of fit that criteria come and they were just blown away. Like, wow, I never knew this was another side of hip hop. I never knew that this was a part of this. I was just, I, they were thinking I'm going to come in, I'm going to hear these 12 guys up on stage shaking white towels going, ooh, you can't even understand anything. And I was like, well, that's, yeah, that's an element. But start with something, you know, easy. You know, going to a, going to a coffee house and listening to some spoken word. And then afterwards, those artists, they love to talk. Yeah. Go, hey, you know, how did you get into this? What's happening? What's going on, you know? Um, and I think that's one of the places that you can kind of engage in because then from there, you're able to kind of begin to move forward. Um, and you want to find some people. And this is where I would say, this is where it's, it's going to be up to the person to be vulnerable to actually go in and actually establish that, you know, because it means that you're going to have to put, you know, put yourself out there on the line and get into a culture that you may not be necessarily comfortable with. Um, the other person, you know, you've got somebody who's maybe already in the, um, in the culture, but they may not necessarily, maybe they've stepped away from it. I know I did that for a while. You know, I was in the hip hop culture, I came into the church and I was completely Christ against culture. Uh, but then when I was, I was coming back, I just started asking a lot of the kids I was working with, just like, hey, tell me about your experience and where, where do you go for this? And let me come with you and let me listen to some of the stuff. And it's engaging in that, that you'll begin to, if you're open-minded enough, to learn about what it is that God is actually doing within this culture, within this society. Now, I will say a caveat. Uh, Hip-hop is a spiritual society, a spiritual community. It's not all Christian. And so you're going to see elements of Nation of Islam, 5%er theology, Rastafarianism, mysticism. And so if you're not prepared for that, that can throw you off and really turn you off really quick. Now, for me, I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable with those. I, I don't necessarily have issues, per se. I don't necessarily agree with everything, but that doesn't necessarily, for me at least, as I look at missions, preclude me or stop me from going into a culture just because there's something that's like, oh, that, that's foreign to me. So just, you know, a little caveat, a little footnote there. Be aware that, you know, when you go into this, you may meet some cats that are from 5%, you know, or from Nation of Islam, and you can look those up kind of online. Uh, but in a nutshell, you know, those cats are looking at things a little bit differently, and I, want, I definitely want to mention that because that, that, that's part of it. So I think engaging, and we talk about the ethnos, you know, Christ calls us in Matthew 28, uh, the Great Commission, you know, the ethnos, that's, that word is ethnicity in the Greek. It's where we get the word ethnicity from. It means literally those who are different from you. So when he says go into the nations, go into the world, that's just it. 
And for me, this is, this is part of it because this culture is growing. It's not just, and it's not just a U.S. thing. As we know, Latin America is blowing up right now. I was in Paris a few years ago, and one of the, I mean, that's a huge subculture in, in Paris right now. In the underground is hip hop. You know, and I wasn't even able to speak French with these cats, but you know what? The, through the music, we were able to communicate. And that was powerful. Uh, Kenya, um, there's a cat out of Iraq called the Iron Sheik off the old wrestler from the 80s. Right. And he's talking about the kind of imperialistic, capitalistic, you know, American forces. And he's talking about these, you know, these, all these different things in both Arabic and in English. And that's powerful stuff, powerful stuff. So I don't want people to think, oh, this is just a U.S. phenomenon. No, it's, it's growing and it's big. And so I think going to the nations, hip hop is the nations. Hip hop is the nations. One of the few musical genres you can pack up and take you know, with you. Anywhere, yeah. Now, I noticed uh, you, you used the term missions. Yes. Now, explain <laughs> to us, I know that there, there's a, a chapter uh, in the book talking about um, missions um, in post 9-11 America. Yes. What, what, what were you talking about there? How, how, how does that relate absolutely. to Absolutely, absolutely. Post 9-11 America, the way I define it is the world that we've lived in after what happened in 9-11. 9-11 changed everything. When you think about what happened with the Patriot Act, when you think about what now that all the hassle we have to go through to go through an airport, you know, just to get security. I mean, um, the scare and the fear really that people have nine, ten years later after after 9-11, that people still fear that. There's also a sense within, at least within U.S. society, that you can't say too much, otherwise you're going to be considered unpatriotic. So some of the things that artists were saying even in the 90s, I wouldn't say could be said today because it's, it's, it's too... Well, it's offsetting because, oh, well, now you're unpatriotic. And if we deem you unpatriotic, we can do some things to you. And so post-9-11 America is really an America that is, is, is it's vastly different. If you think about it, those who were born in the 90s, in the early 90s, like I have a student right now in my class who just turned 19. And for half of her life, it's been war. It's been Iraq. It's been terrorism. You know, we're on the yellow, red alert. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, what a world to grow up in. You know, like you were 10 years old, eight years old when this thing happened. And so now the world is different. So how do we really come around that with the mission, mission, a way of approaching life in a fearful world? You know, Barry Glasser talks about in his excellent book called The Culture of Fear, how Americans are afraid of the wrong thing and really looking at it. Because when people are scared, you can get people to do anything. And that's what I love about the film, The Village. When people are scared, They'll just do just about anything. And so how do we minister in that? How do we deal with that without creating more fear and more angst? And so for me, it's about really, again, dispelling some of the myths, coming in, talking to people, having conversations, uh, and again, once again, listening, <clears throat> engaging, and just being able to sit and listen to people's hurt. Because when I was talking with kids, like I was, I was with Young Life at the time when 9-11 happened, I remember they sent all these counselors down and everything, and I went and talked to my kids that I was working with at the time. I said, you know, how's 9-11 affecting you? They were like, you know, we feel really bad for folks in New York and everything, but this is our daily reality. You know, where is our comfort when we lose somebody who got shot? And where, how, where's, where's our counselors when, you know, when it, maybe we're not flying planes into buildings, but we got somebody, you know, who's terrorizing the community? You know, somebody went crazy at the projects and sniping people off the, the roof and where's people, you know, and saying, so how do you minister in that when this community says, uh, you know, this is, this is a different America? And so, and, 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 it, and it's a difficult time to, to really do that, to try to do something like that. Well, Dan, you know, uh, we're really excited about the, the soul of hip hop. And, <laughs> yes, sir. And uh, rims, tims, and a culture of theology. And Dan, could you just let people know how uh, you know, so this is an amazing resource. How do we get a hold of this? Like, where can we connect with you? How do we get in touch with you? Um, how, how can someone get a hold of this resource? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you can go to whitehodge.com. That's whitehodge, all one word, dot com. You can get the book there on sale for $15 on our website. Um, I am on Facebook. Just look at Daniel White Hodge and uh, you can look me up there. I have a blog at Conversant Life as well. You can look me up there. I'm always blogging about hot topics. Just talked about, you know, Bishop Eddie Long. All right. So um, you can go there. You can look it up. And if you say, well, oh, man, I'm old school. It's in Barnes and Noble. It is at, you know, uh, Borders. There are places like that. But if you want to support a brother, whitehodge.com. Uh, come check us out and uh, you can get your copy. Thanks. Well, Dan, thanks so much for taking some time to just Thank go you. a little bit deeper and hear yes. the heart of what you were thinking Absolutely. Uh, in creating this great resource. Yes. 
And so we're really excited for you and, and, and wish you the very best. And, Thank you. And so forth. So everyone, thanks so much for joining us. Again, my name is Bobby Duran from Urban Youth Workers Institute, and this is Dr. Dan Hodge. Please go uh, and support Dan and uh, you know help this resource get out so more people can be impacted. Thank you very much. Thank you.